And uh, today I'll tell you about uh, VQEs, and specifically, um, I'm going to focus. Oops, I'm going to focus on uh, quantum simulation. So uh, the idea of quantum simulation originates from Feynman's uh, paper, which um, was more thinking about an analog setting where you create a Hamiltonian of a system that you want to simulate, and uh, you have some way to vary the parameters, and then you can study the system in a sort of a uh, various uh, regimes and look at things like phase transitions and so on. Uh, on the other hand, in digital quantum simulation, um, we uh, think of a universal quantum computer where the evolution can be decomposed in a set of elementary quantum gates. And uh, there we can um, formulate algorithms for finding eigenenergies of many uh, body systems and other properties. So I'll focus entirely on the second type of simulation <clears throat> and on the problem of uh, fermionic Hamiltonians, at least in the, in the majority of the talk. So uh, the Hamiltonian is the standard interaction of electrons uh, with nuclei and with each other. And we have chosen here the second quantization, <clears throat> where of course there's already a basis chosen and the Coulomb integrals have been computed so that the Hamiltonian can be brought in a form shown here with fermionic uh, operators in second quantization. Now, one issue is uh, that we need to map the fermions to qubits. And since fermions can be, uh, fermionic orbitals can be either occupied or unoccupied, it's very natural to map um, these two states onto the two, two states of a qubit. And the way to do that is uh, something called the jordan wigner transformation, which is well known in, uh, in uh, many areas of physics and has pre-existed this field, uh, where you map, let's say, the zero to an unoccupied orbital and the one state of the qubit to an occupied orbital. But that's, you're not done there. You still need to preserve fermionic anti-commutation relations, which are non-trivial and are shown here. And since qubits are distinguishable to impose uh, these anti-commutation relations, what you need to do is have a, a string of Z operators, which essentially pick up whether that uh, qubit is in state zero or one, or equivalently, uh, if the orbital is filled or empty and give the appropriate minus signs to that term. <clears throat> As a result, you can express the Hamiltonian uh, following this uh, procedure into a form that looks like this, where P is a poly string. So it's a tensor product of poly operators on the qubits. And there's a coefficient here that comes from uh, these integrals. So the way that uh, is envisioned that you solve these problems in an actual quantum computer is to use a phase estimation algorithm and uh, algorithms that ori originate from it. So you want to apply the time evolution operator to the many body system conditionally. So you still, you need to prepare uh, the state that um, of which you want to find the energy. And typically, this might be the ground state. So this is a many body, uh, many qubit state. And then you have uh, an ancilla or more qubits where, where you do a conditional operation and you sort of kick back the phase that this operator picks up into these ancillas and then you make measurements. And based on the statistics, you can figure out what the energy is. So this is uh, very non-trivial because this is a many body operator and you need to do a conditional exponentiation of it. So the terms that consist H do not commute. So you need to do some kind of trotterization and this leads to very long gates. This is just one example where um, you can uh, see how, uh, how you would do it for, for a small for a number of qubits here. So the phase estimation algorithm is beyond the scope of what we can do right now or even in the near future. And for that reason, people have started looking into uh, what can we do with more near-term quantum processors. And uh, uh, specifically with processors that also include noise and are not too large, also called NISC. Uh, and simulation of many body uh, physics is probably the most interesting problem you can solve in these uh, uh, computers. Hopefully you can solve something that you cannot do classically, and even in the long term, this is probably one of the most interesting problems from a scientist's point of view. So these types of uh, processors focus on uh, hybrid uh, classical quantum algorithms, since the quantum processor is not 
too powerful, you want to leverage uh, the classical computer as well. And this uh, leads to uh, using or uh, trying to employ variational quantum algorithms. And th these are based on uh, the variational principle of quantum mechanics, which also, of course, is well known and pre-exists uh, the field of quantum information, where you uh, transfer the difficult part of the variational um, uh, algorithm onto the quantum computer, which is creating a many-body state uh, in some way, uh, parameterized in a certain way, denoted by these datas. So you have some reference state, you apply some uh, unitary operator, you create this trial state, and then you also use the quantum computer to measure the energy in this form. And you feed that into a classical computer where you do the optimization, you vary theta, and you keep going, just uh, repeat this process until you get uh, an energy that's presumably and hopefully the ground state energy. And there's been many, many very nice experiments that you might hear about in the next few talks from uh, both uh, Google, IBM, and uh, other groups as well. So here I just have some examples with superconducting qubits where they have shown uh, demonstrations of ground state energies of simple molecules. So these are, of course, things you can do classically, but it's still very nice that now we can do them also with a quantum computer. And we're hoping that by improving both on the algorithm side and on the hardware side, we can do something uh, less, less uh, simple and less trivial. All right, so uh, in the rest of my talk, I'm going to be focusing entirely on the ansatz part of the VQEs. There's, of course, other very non-trivial parts, such as the measurement and optimization. And maybe you'll hear more from uh, the other speakers in the session about that. But I just want to acknowledge that these are non-trivial things that I'm not going to be talking about. All right, so focusing now on the ansatz, you could ask what are properties of a good ansatz? And I, I'd like to mention something that might be obvious, but the choice of the ansatz is crucial. If your ansatz is not good enough, which I will try to define what I mean by that later, then you might not find the solution or not, not even something close to the solution you're looking for. And the things you want to take into account is that quantum coherence is very limited. So you want as shallow circuits as possible without sacrificing accuracy too much. Uh, classical optimization is not infinitely powerful, so you don't want to throw too many optimization uh, parameters to your optimizer or unnecessarily many optimization parameters. And of course, you want to span the space where the solution lives. So some uh, ansatz that have been considered uh, by the community, these are, th there are others, so I just chose the ones that I believe are most common, are something called hardware efficient ansatz, where you basically take whatever your native gates are, and typically you have some entangler here which is not parameterized, and you have some single qubit gates that are parameterized and you just alternate them. So this is, uh, you know, by design, it's compatible with the hardware, so it should perform well in that respect. Um, and it's pretty general, so presumably it can uh, encode many different solutions of many different problems. On the other hand, it's ad hoc. So even though it's quite expressible, uh, it's not guaranteed to be exact. It can be inefficient because to reach the state you're looking for, you might need to use too many of these um, gates. And there's also been this uh, very interesting paper showing that for random circuits like this, uh, there are barren plateaus in the optimization step. On the other hand, you could look into something that uh, uh, imports some knowledge from the domain you're trying to solve. So a chemistry inspired uh, 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 ansatz for, for chemical problems is a uh, unitary coupled cluster. So this is just a coupled cluster operator shown here where you keep only singles and doubles. So two fermionic operators here and four here and that's it. So one challenge here is that translating the fermionic operators into quantum gates um, leads to long circuits. And the trotterized form of these, if you just stop at low trotter order, uh, it's not just long, but it's also not unique. So you could, uh, we've shown in this paper that sometimes you cannot hit chemical accuracy depending on what order you choose. And it's also not proven to be exact. So the bottom line of this slide is that both of these ansatz are generic in some sense. So uh, on this side, this is entirely generic, entirely given by the hardware. On this side, 
for any chemical problem, UCCSD tells you just choose the sound sets and then optimize your parameters, but it doesn't know anything else about your Hamilton. So what I want to talk about today is tailoring the ANSATS to the particular problem you're trying to solve. And we have two ways of doing this. One is to use circuits that preserve, or in other words, built in some symmetry that you know your system has. The other approach is using an algorithm we have developed we call ADAPT-VP. And the features that we're after is to have as shallow circuits as possible, to have either small or minimal number of optimization parameters, and hopefully an exact <coughs> uh, ansatz. So in the first case where we are encoding symmetries into an ansatz, we want to first uh, you know, point out that we're, we're interested in creating states, not some general evolution operator. So what we can do is we can count and parameterize the relevant states with a given symmetry, and then impose the relevant symmetries at the circuit level. So if you think of your Hilbert space, uh, you might have a sector where the states of a given symmetry live, and then somewhere in there will be your ground state if you know it to have the symmetry. So the first uh, type of symmetry you can impose is particle number symmetry. So typically in the problems we're interested in, the number of fermions is fixed, number of electrons is fixed, which means um, that I, out of my n orbitals, uh, which means n qubits, I only want to have m excitations. So I go from uh, two, uh, times two to the n plus one minus two real parameters to uh, two n choose m minus two real parameters. Uh, so an ingredient here is this uh, particle preserving gate. So if you look at uh, this matrix here, this is in the zero 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 one one zero one one basis. Uh, this is designed to only mix zero one and one zero, and so it doesn't change the number of ones you have. And what we have done is. We have come up with a circuit that is guaranteed to give you all possible states that have a given uh, particle symmetry, which you, uh, particle number symmetry, which you fix with, by fixing these x's in the beginning, these not gates, and uh, having these nearest neighbor A gates from here. And we know exactly when to stop because all we need to do is count parameters. So we've shown that um, you can hit any target state within the space with, with uh, check this numerically by checking the fidelity with random states that, that preserve the symmetry. And uh, uh, in, case, in most cases, we also have time reversal symmetry in the system. So that cuts down the parameters even more. So here you have n choose m naught times two. Um, so compared to other efforts to do similar thing in the literature, we've shown that our result has the fewest number of C naught gates. And we have a, a bunch of examples where we uh, test our circuits um, using, in this case, Qiskit, and comparing to built-in ansatz in Qiskit, and you see that the number of parameters in this example is the smallest for our circuits. That's guaranteed to be the case, no matter what molecule we do. In some cases, we also have smaller number of C-naughts, but that's not guaranteed. And we also have in this paper, um, we also show how you preserve total spin uh, spin projection and so on. So we can actually build in pretty much any symmetry. So uh, what you can do is you can also think about going even further. So instead of just encoding symmetries, can I also use more, my homo more knowledge of my Hamiltonian? So can we find ansatz that are even more tailored to the Hamiltonian we're trying to solve? And you could think about kind of these ad hoc or hardware efficient ansatz sitting in one end of the spectrum, the symmetry preserving ansatz I just talked about somewhere in the middle, and what I'll tell you about now being the most tailored ansatz for the problem you're uh, solving. So the key idea here is that we want this, the system to be simulated to dictate its own ansatz, and we uh, constructed in a way that it's compact, so it's iteratively grown one unitary operator at a time. And a key ingredient here of this algorithm, algorithm is a pool of operators, which we call A. And uh, each of these is exponentiated, and uh, this is your unitary. So, so yeah. So uh, this is an overview of the algorithm. So you have your operator pool. I'll discuss later how you might want to choose that. But at this point, this is kind of a, something you can input. 
and you have a prepared state, let's say a Hartree-Fox state, and then you look at every operator from the pool and you ask yourself, if I choose any one of these, how much does it affect the energy? And we, we ask, answer that question through a gradient uh, condition. So we take the mean value of the energy and differentiate it with respect to each uh, parameter. And the nice thing, uh, this is of course well known, is that you get a commutator here. So you can view this step as generating a new Hamiltonian and you can view this, measuring this as measuring a Hamiltonian. So this step is also envisioned, the subroutine is envisioned to be, uh, to take place on a quantum computer as well. And since each of these measurements is uh, independent, you could view this step as being parallelizable on many different quantum processors. So this tells you to select the operator that uh, changes the energy the most, so the largest gradient, and then you append that to your, uh, to your state and you ask if there's convergence. Strictly speaking, convergence is when all these are zero, but you can put a cutoff. And uh, when you select, the, then you select the operator with the largest gradient and you append it to, to your uh, current state. And then you re-optimize all the parameters, that parameter and all the ones that came before it. And now you have a new reference state and you just keep going. And you stop when you're happy enough here. So presumably when you reach uh, chemical accuracy or when the gradients are smaller than some cutoff. So in the first, um, yeah, so I already mentioned that this is quantum parallelizable and the algorithm ADAPT stands for adaptive derivative assembled to do this step, problem tailored weekly. So a uh, crucial component of ADAPT is the operator pool. And you could ask uh, questions such as how should this be chosen and how do different pools perform? So I want to answer these questions now. So the simplest thing we can do is go back and look at the UCCSD and just choose similar operators as they have there. So uh, singles and doubles and use that as our operator pool. So this is what we did in the first uh, numerical tests. Uh, so here we are testing uh, how, uh, we're, we're testing how the algorithm performs for a lithium hydride, beryllium hydride, and a chain of hydrogen uh, atoms. So we're comparing this to the exact solution. These are small enough molecules that we can solve them exactly. To UCCSD, a hard refock, which is not expected to do well, and then three different levels of ADAPT depending on where you set the threshold. And these show the energy as a function of uh, uh, interatomic distance. But since here you cannot see really that much what's going on, I'm going to just plot the error. So here you see the same uh, x-axis, but the y-axis is now the error and it's logarithmic. And you see that uh, ADAPT outperforms UCCSD in uh, most of the cases. Uh, so so it, it always outperforms it if we set the threshold criterion to, to do something like uh, 0.01 of log. But you could ask to what, uh, you know, at what expense does it do that? So one important thing to ask is how many operators am I appending in order to do better? And actually we show here that it performs better even in that metric. So here, if I look at um, the number of parameters that my ANSATS has um, uh, for, for different I'm sorry, for, for different interatomic distances. You see that UCCSD is of course flat because it's a fixed ansatz, it doesn't change. However, uh, ADAPT not only changes, but also outperforms UCCSD uh, in, in some cases by uh, a factor of two or more. And the only case where you need more parameters uh, in ADAPT is the case where actually, if you look at the orange line here, UCCSD doesn't perform within chemical accuracy. So you could ask, you know, how come it does so well? Is it really the fact that your algorithm is tailored to your problem or is it that you're using a product instead of e to the i sum of terms? So what we did here is we compare how ADAPT performs compared to different orderings. So we just randomly pick orderings or we pick them according to some prescription. And you can see here that 
all these are the other orderings and adopt performs qualitatively different and better. So we have done similar plots for other molecules and for other bond distances, and this is consistent. Just letting you know five minutes, Sophia. Okay. Um, so, uh, so far we worked with fermionic operators, but we want, um, since each fermionic operator gives on the order of n gates, we actually want to see what happens if I do something more hardware efficient. So here we take Pauli strings and uh, use those as our pool. And we need to have an odd number of y's because uh, otherwise the gradients are zero and we want to keep everything real. So here, if I compare the fermionic adapt I just showed you to uh, this qubit adapt, uh, and this is the adapt iteration number, you see that, uh, so, so this is the qubit adapt. The fermionic adapt actually needs, needs fewer parameters. So you, you might be tempted to say this better, but then if I ask how many C naughts do I need, which is the currency in these NISC uh, processors, actually the qubit adapt does um, dramatically better. And I should mention here that we didn't try to compile or optimize qubit adapt. So this is more to be used as a comparison and not so much as an absolute performance. And then the next uh, concern should be how big should this operator pool be? Because if your pool is chosen to be too large, you need too many of these intermediate measurements. So what we did is we started from a chosen pool from eight qubits, which is more than 450 operators. And then we just started reducing it and we checked convergence for several examples. And we consistent, consistently saw that uh, it performed well until we chopped off too many. So this uh, leads to the notion of complete pools. So there exist uh, pools, which if I uh, act on them on any reference state, I can get any other state. And we, we, the criterion for finding complete pools is to take all the operators in the pool, take their commutators, take the commutator with a commutator until you run out of operators, and then require that this set B that uh, emerges forms a complete basis when, acts on, when it acts on an arbitrary state. So we indeed checked that this is the case. So these are the ones that satisfy this criteria. They always converge and these are the ones that don't. And uh, now we're interested not only in complete pools, but we're interested in how much, how much can we get away with shrinking our pool since that incurs more measurements here and still be able to have convergence. So that uh, leads to the idea of minimal complete pools. So minimal complete pool is the smallest size complete pool. And we have actually shown that uh, this is linear in the number of qubits. So this is really, really nice because it means that you only have a linear overhead in extra measurements uh, in the number of qubits. And these are just some, example, some examples of such pools. So in the very last minute or so, I just want to show you uh, how ADAPT does in the context of optimization. So uh, there are certain well-known optimization problems such, such as the max cut problem which can be mapped onto classical Ising Hamiltonians uh, shown here. And the QAA algorithm is an uh, algorithm well known from uh, 2014, where you start from a state like this and you apply up in an alternating fashion, the problem Hamiltonian exponentiated and a mixer shown here, which is X rotations by the same angle on all the qubits. So what we want to do is want, we want to see, can we do better if we use ideas from ADAPT? So we want to preserve the QAA structure. So we have this alternating C operator, which is the problem Hamiltonian, and we alternate it with different mixers. And the mixers we choose via a pool using an adopt criterion. And we have checked here single qubit gate operators as mixers and multi qubit gates. So this uh, operator pool contains all these plus uh, two qubit gates. And what we have seen is that when we allow for the multi-qubit gate mixers, we actually get a dramatically uh, better convergence in the energy for at least the max cut problem, which we did for these two uh, different graphs. And these are the pools that contain entangling operators. So again, here you could ask, you know, what is the price you pay for that? Since these contain entangling operators, that means that for a given layer, I should have you know, using more entanglement. But the meaningful thing to ask is for fixed accuracy, do you really have more C naughts or less or fewer? And in our case, actually, uh, we showed that if we compare 
how many C nodes we have and how many parameters we have with this uh, multi uh, qubit entangling gate pool, it chops down, it not only performs better, but also chops down in the number of C nodes and optimization parameters. So we think this is a very um, uh, kind of promising approach for optimization as well. All right, so to summarize, I discussed our uh, work on uh, tailoring ANSATSE to different uh, Hamiltonians. So first you can impose symmetries and have symmetry preserving circuits. And then there's uh, the algorithm we call ADAPT, which uh, showed you a VQ incarnation, meaning a general Hamiltonian with uh, off-diagonal terms, as well as a QAOA incarnation where um, the Hamiltonian is diagonal. So with that, I'll just leave the slide up to acknowledge uh, my students and postdocs who did this work, and thank you for your attention.